Welcome to the Grow Your Practice podcast. Hi, I'm your host, Chad Madden, owner of Madden Physical Therapy and Breakthrough. Join me each week as we dive into the best practices, systems, principles, tips, and tricks to help you grow your private practice. We are at the top of the hour. Uh, We're going to get started here, and we're going to talk about a request from last week, which was, how do I help my therapist fill their schedule? So here's what I did. I went to um, our marketing team and asked them, this was last week, the therapists that we have, so 53, 55 clinicians or so, just made another offer yesterday to another DPT, but the therapists that do the best at keeping their schedule full, what do they do? So they, they brainstormed around this. There are five big buckets that I'm going to go over here in our time together today. But, and I think there's like maybe 12 or 15 different strategies. So as an owner, when you're working with your clinicians or manager, director, or whatever position you might be, what are some things that you would do? So if I was your therapist, my schedule wasn't full, how would you typically address me? How would you manage me so that my schedule was full? Where, what would you have me do? Honestly, we don't do anything. <laughs> Where they, 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 well, some of our therapists actually know their clients that are waiting to get in and will give us suggestions. But mostly we dig through the wait list, dig through patients that have fallen off the schedule. Most of, most of it falls on the front office. Okay. So, but, but you do have that, you you do have that Joanne where a therapist will say, Hey, by the way, Barry called in, he's on, I see him on the waiting list. Can you get him? Can you call him and schedule him? I would say I have one out of eight who will give me a name. <laughs> if, if we've gone through the wait list and we don't have anybody else, most of the time they, they don't have anything to offer. <laughs> okay. In your practice, is there anything else that a therapist will do other than the relying on the reception team to go to the wait list to fill in their schedule? Not really. My husband and I do all the networking. So we're always meeting and greeting and all of that. And no, they don't. I would love if they did. All right. They don't. Uh, but I would love to hear ideas. That's why I'm I'm on today. So Yeah, we, we, we'll, I'll be sharing a lot of ideas. So Michael had shared, we do nothing, just eat the time. Front office works, cancel list well. That's great. That's something else here. For the owners that are on the call, what you're doing, how does it work? Like, do they, so if I have, let's say I'm 75% full or 80% full, I have some sort of temporary lull in my schedule is what you're doing. Does it work at all to help me fill my schedule? So, so say the question again, if, if what we're doing as far as like just working the wait list, how well is that working? Is that what you're asking? You know, for the most part, well, I mean, most of our therapists have a wait list of patients that are trying to get in. We're pretty much completely booked for the next month. So as people are, um, aren't able to get in certain weeks, we have them on a wait list. So we, we kind of rely on the wait list to help us fill those cancellations when they come, but it's when they don't have somebody on the wait list, you know, then it's a little more problematic. Got it. What you have in place now works really well, though. And and you have a problem that most practices don't have, Joanne, which is you have tons of people wanting to come and mm-hmm. see you. Great. Michael said, works well enough. I try to emphasize to the therapist that uh, bank this time to minimize feelings of burnout over all the, year, over all the years, it seems okay. All right. So five big buckets that I'll go through. The first one is the clinician's ability to control their own schedule. So I have a couple things around that. The second big bucket is how they're doing on their evaluations. And we'll talk about that. The third, fourth, and fifth are all around marketing. So things that clinician can do to help market. And usually it's not a one-to-many thing. They're not running ads. They're not going to do anything like that. But there are some things that they can do to help and specifically have it broken out into patient marketing, referral sources, what they do with referral sources. Joanne, you were sharing that you and your husband will go and network, right? I would assume that's with referral sources and other organizations in the community, getting your name out there. This is what the therapist can do in the clinic. 
the clinician can do. And then the final bucket, number five, is cold traffic marketing. So we have schedule control, evaluations, patient marketing, which is reactivations and word of mouth, referral sources, cold traffic marketing. And I'll go through each one of these at a time. So number one is schedule control. Our best therapist, what our marketing team and reception team noticed is they will, they will, they fill their gaps. And I said, okay, so what's the best case scenario look like? And they gave some examples and they said, this therapist will come out and actively work with the front desk team to make sure that there are no gaps in the schedule and that they're minimizing, for example, like double books. On the opposite end, they'll have therapists who will be very, very busy in the morning, very, very extremely busy and double booked or worse in the afternoon, but they'll have gaps in their schedule of 45 minutes to two hours. And they won't, and really what that was for the feedback is like an unwillingness to have a conversation with the patient to get them to come in to a different time other than what the patient's top preference was. They're just, it's like, oh, you want to come in at five? Okay, I have somebody else, but yeah, you can come in at five rather than trying to move anybody else around. So that was number one under schedule control. The next one was balances evaluations with treatment visits. And <clears throat> we've been trying it for 20 plus years. You know, it would be nice if I could just push a button and every single, every week, you know, if we need 30 evals in a clinic that we just get 30 this week, 30 next week, 30 <laughs> That never happens, yeah. but what our best clinics will do is they will limit the the number of evals in a day for a clinician, and on average, it, the cap seems to be three, so they'll never have a clinician that will see more than three per day, and that allows them to, even if they're scheduling ahead, which all of our clinicians should be doing, we schedule out the full plan of care on day one, it prevents them from just being overly burdened with a, a ton of evals and it helps us spread the evals out. They were the only two points I had on schedule control for anyone else that has just joined. I saw Brian, you just hopped on Mark, Bob, also known as Jess, Michael, anything else that you're doing around schedule control with the clinician, how they can work with the front desk to better control. Um, we'll call it the evenness of their schedule. Again, I'm going to say our front office does it all. <laughs> You know, we see a patient for an hour, which I know is very unique in this industry. So we manage kind of how many initials get put in their schedule, where their doc times are, where they're, we don't we ever double book a client. It's always one-on-one -on -one treatment. So the therapists don't really have any control over their schedule, I guess. You know, we kind of do it all for them. Okay. Maybe I can ask that question in a different way. Is there, <clears throat> if you went to your, how many receptionists, front desk people do you have, Joanne? One in each office. What it, We have backup people okay. doing other jobs that help out. Okay. And how many total offices? Two. Two. Okay. So somewhere between three and four reception. If you were to ask them their favorite clinician to work with, is there like one or two that would jump out for them right away? Or is it? They don't even really work together at all. Do they have a favorite? I mean, probably, yeah. I mean, I think those that are more involved in directing things are easier. Other than that, we we kind of dictate whatever okay. goes in their schedule. <laughs> all right. So you solved it. Not really a best practice to pull out. I was, yeah, yeah. just trying. Okay, good. Anybody else uh, have anything on scheduling before I move over to evaluations? All right. I have one thing. We really worked with our therapists to kind of change the verbiage of how they talk about the plan of care. Yeah. We, we talk about a plan of care just like a prescription you would take to the pharmacy. It's written by the doctor. We need to fill it as it's written. So it's really important that you show up for your visits when they're, you know, three times a week for six weeks or whatever. Because when I go to the pharmacist for an antibiotic, I don't get to choose that I'll take it on Monday, but I won't take it on Tuesday and I'll catch up six weeks from now. So just making making the 
connection and something that everyone has experience in because not, not all of our patients have experience in PT or understand the importance of it. So making that connection into something that everyone can relate to of the importance of following the prescription seems to kind of get that buy-in with that first visit with getting them to schedule it out and the importance of showing up for their visits. That's great. And Jess, you just literally walked into the next thing, which was how our clinicians do the evaluation. So yeah, I loved all your points there. And how's that working out for you? Better. Better than just, I don't know why I'm here. My doctor said I needed to show up, but I really don't want to be here because. I appreciate you sharing that. The What our team had shared is uh, number one is an assumptive mindset. So whether it's a free screen discovery visit, initial eval, whatever you're calling your first appointment, the our best clinicians will just assume that the person in front of them has a need and wants help and they will uh, and how we measure that is we look at graduation rate and <clears throat> so it's if i start 20 plans of care how many of those people achieve their goals and are are eventually discharged from care and yeah so let's say if we a clinician sees 20 and 8 of them graduate the graduation rate would be 40% our standard, the bar that we're looking at is 80%. And the easiest way to influence that is what the clinician is doing on day one in the evaluation. They do a very thorough evaluation. If they implement many of the things that you said there, Jess, and they schedule out a full plan of care, you know, they're, they're acting with authority within their license. They're a confident guide going through the process. And that graduation rate is going to be high. And that person's schedule is going to be more full. The other one is just a, and, and this just happened for us. So for years, we've done this promotion, greatest promotion ever. If you've read Killer Marketing Secrets or have been through any of our old marketing courses, but in, yeah, so it's a promotion that we ran to our past patient list before we've done it since 2011. And what it does is it creates this influx, inflow of patients that carry us through our slow season. We're here in the Northeast. For us, it's Thanksgiving through the end of the year is our slowest season. Number two is uh, right now. So June and July, we get this little law as soon as school lets out, and then it fills up again. But what we just did is we switched over to a recheck day, which is once somebody graduates therapy, they can come in for a 10-minute appointment, and we take a look at their objective measurements. We ask them how they're doing. And we drove all of them to, this was a test for us to see if we could replace the, basically the free exam or greatest promotion every day. And we had 170 people show up and 10 people scheduled a plan of care. And I, that, that was a failure on my part. And I mean, really what we should be doing, if we're in conservative care, where we invest a lot for our degrees if somebody's standing in front of us, we should be looking for a need. And so I, I just did this and we can do it right. So both Brian and Joanne, I can see you on. So physically speaking, Brian, how are you feeling right now? What's the th thing that's bothering you the most physically? Like a mock piece of this? So yeah. Like yeah, anything, yeah, yeah. Real life uh, body. Is there anything bothering you right now? What's bothering you the most? Well, yeah. Let's say my back. I like back pain. Okay. Do you really have back pain? No. <laughs> I wasn't sure if you wanted me to. What's the thing that has bothered you the last? What's the last injury that you had? Probably my back. Yeah. And what, how long ago was that? Two months ago. Okay, great. So if, if I ask you how you're feeling, which is what our clinicians were doing on that day, most people out of politeness and good manners are going to say, I feel good. I feel fine. I'm Okay. So, so what I, they're going to have a generic answer like that. And prior to you, Brian, eight out of eight people that I asked that other follow-up question to what's bothering you the most had a very real problem. My shoulders bothering me, my back's bothering me, whatever it is. And you happen to have a back issue, which just was your 60 days removed from it. Right. So, and I pulled out a story from, oh man, I was in college a long time ago, but I was struggling on a clinical. I was at Cincinnati Sports Medicine. My clinical instructor was Mark Paterno. And I remember a couple of weeks in, Mark was like, what are you doing? And he was like, just like when you're going through 
and you're working with a patient, how are you thinking about it? And I started regurgitating, you know, a really not smart answer. And uh, he said, listen, he was like, we're going to keep this super simple. Your job is to find a need with that person in front of you and fill it. That's it. He was like, you don't have to make it more complex than that. If they have back pain, you want to understand the function behind what is. So, Brian, back to you. What activity was bothering you the most with your back? When I was squatting deadlift. Great. So lifting, back pain, great. And then it's solving that problem for you, right? That's what's valuable to you. And he was like, you don't have to make it more complex than that. And many times I think, especially entry level clinician, is we can get lost in what's the right special test to do? What's the right objective you know, findings I should be looking for. What are the right questions in the history? And he was like, just keep it simple. You're finding a need and you're filling it. And oddly, that's what our marketing team had brought up as well. And, and our front desk team is our best therapist. That's exactly what they're doing. Before we continue with this episode, here's a word about our next event, the Revenue Per Visit Virtual Summit. Private practice owners, are you tired of declining reimbursements and shrinking margins? Join me on July 18th for the Revenue Per Visit Virtual Summit. It's a value-packed, free, online live event where you'll discover strategies that you can put into action in your practice to boost your revenue per patient and enhance your practice's profitability. You'll hear from industry leaders and private practice owners like Mark Callanan from Anovis, who will be talking about how to increase revenue with cash-based services. And Sterling Carter of Sterling PT, and Wellness, who was able to increase his reimbursement rates by over 15% with providers. With more than eight speakers, five hours of actionable training, and hundreds of practices in attendance, you don't want to miss out on this game-changing event. Click the link below to register today, and I'll see you there. Thank you for listening this far. Now, back to the episode. Third big group is patient marketing. And what we notice here, I'll read four different things. Number one is a handwritten letter from the clinician to the patient drives reactivations and word of mouth referrals. The second big thing there is they use multimedia. So if they're doing direct mail, they might also be using texting. They might also be using email for patient communications. A few are even using direct messaging via social if they're if they know somebody's on Facebook or Instagram, whatever it might be. Third one there is they ask for a word of mouth referral at the win. We taught this on February 16th internally, and we had a couple of clinicians and go back. I know one clinician had four friends and family referrals in a week just by implementing a simple three-step process that we taught. The fourth one is they follow up personally with word of mouth referrals. So Brian, you said that you were going to talk with Helen. You did that. What's the best way for us to get Helen the help that she needs? And then they actually follow up with it when somebody recommends somebody else. The next big bucket is referral sources that I have here. One big thing is personal calls to the referral source. This is like a physician, nurse practitioner, PA, but they'll make a personal call to the referral source regarding the patient. So they'll have a, t a conversation about the patient. And then the second one under there is clear and consistent communication. What we noticed is at least where we're at in central Pennsylvania, the Referral source won't read the entire note. They're not going to read through our strength testing, range of motion, everything else, but they'll read a little section called the note. And it's basically, hey, working with Brian in the clinic for his back pain. He's back to deadlifting. Uh, what are you deadlifting, Brian? 415. I'm going for 415. Um, Very accurate. Just a guess. Zoom distorts it a little bit, but so, you know, and he did really well. Thank you for the referral, right? Like something basic like that in the notes section of your EMR, your documentation is usually what the physician will read. And then the final bucket here is cold traffic marketing. This is where we had the most input. Social sharing of events to their personal pages is, is a big one. Next one here was personal outreach to workshop or event attendees. If they're out in the community and they see somebody, they'll follow up when they get back to the office with whoever they were speaking with. Next one was if they're hosting an event, there's a strong close and conversion point that they're good at. Fourth one under there is high engagement at events. They're talking with a lot of people. They're asking a lot of questions, generating a lot of interest. 
And then the final one there is they, and this was primarily in a workshop and it was around uh, Jan, our director and partner in Hershey. She personalizes her content around the attendees. So if somebody says I have shoulder bursitis and she's not, wasn't going to talk about shoulder bursitis, she'll include it and personalize it within um, the presentation. But in the end, she makes the attendees feel special. So yeah, that I think five, six, seven, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 15 different things on how to fill the checklist. That was really John Kelly's questions. And I, I know he's in New Zealand right now. The other, yeah. So I'll open this up for any questions that you have. The other thing that I wanted to mention is around uh, this idea and specifically improving uh, revenue within our clinics. We have an event coming up. It's going to be uh, July 18th. It is a virtual summit. So the format will be like this. Uh, we've run these before and we've had over 500 registrants for them. So that it's July 18th, 10 a.m. Eastern to 3 p.m. Eastern. And to register for that, it is free. You can go to getbreakthrough.com forward slash learn. Other than that, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself or just ask it in the chat. Chad, I had a question. I, I've seen some of your correspondence on how you guys have increased reimbursement rates for yeah. insurance companies. Quick background, we're a larger clinic. I've, I've, we've had, we have several locations that I'm involved in on the East Coast in Connecticut and not far from me in Connecticut and Long Island. What are some of the best ways you found when you're growing to leverage that from an increased reimbursement rate perspective when you're asking? You're making a bigger impact. You're serving more lives. And how can you use that to talk with the insurance companies? Yeah. Yeah. So we at PPS last year, whatever it's called, that private practice section of the APTA, we had put something out. It's called the renegotiation workbook. We interviewed Tony Sear and a few other owners. There's a pretty big initiative in Louisiana asking what they had. And what they're, within that book, we have a template on how to go through your unique practice. Say, this is where we were at two years ago, three years ago. This is where we're at today. This is where we're going. The impact we're going to leave um, in the community, the number of lives that we're going to touch that are your subscribers. And here's where we need to be. Right. So in that, it's just a really a Mad Libs type template. And then if you want to take it to the next level, Brian, what we did is we we feed that into an AI, you know, chat GPT or a rewriter and but use that data like your growth rate should be in there. It, it's a like we're helping more people. We're growing year over year. We're going to continue to do this. And we need to work with you to, you know, especially if you're losing, I know that area is, especially with your cost of business can get pretty tight. You have the downward pressure on reimbursements at the same time, you have the upward pressure on costs, especially space and employment costs. Yeah. So you, you use the growth as a way to make it, which is exactly what we do in my cool. own practice as well. Yeah. No, that's helpful. That makes sense. That makes sense. Have you, have you found, I'm sorry, I don't want to, I don't want to dominate all the Q&A time. We recently just acquired another clinic. It's a different EIN number. How have you had success with clinics that have multiple locations, but they're under different EIN numbers, like different ownerships? So there's different partnerships that share similar people and contracts. What what type of success are you referring to? So in terms of increasing, like, for instance, we just acquired a new clinic. It has, it basically have a different owner for that one location. It's in the same state. Yep. But it has a different, different EIN number, right? So different contracts. So yeah. we'd like to try and link them and obviously raise reimbursement rates, right? So that's the idea behind it. Yeah, you're you're way over my pay grade here, but <laughs> got it. Okay. So, I, was, uh, I was just curious if you had experience well, I, that. Yeah. But I know who to talk with. Okay. That's huge. I mean that'd be um, huge. So yeah, anytime we're looking at M A or, or I'm working with an owner who's going through M A, contact Paul Welk right away. And almost any compliance company, I mean, I'm most familiar with Mary DeLong and Alicia at BCMS, but they can walk you through how to do that the right way. And oh. yeah, Paul Welk would be my first call. Awesome. Cool. Thanks. I appreciate that. Right. Any other questions here? Anybody else in the group? Mark, Joanna, Joanne also. We have a Joanna and a Joanne, right? Michael, Jess. On the, on the therapist side, so 
your suggestion is mostly, I mean, I feel like, I feel like our therapists do a very thorough job on their initial evaluations, but you're finding it like really selling the, the plan of care. I mean, we, we schedule to the plan of care. So I don't know what, I feel like I'm, I'm still missing something in that therapist connection, getting people to be more accountable to that. I liked, um, who was that, that, yeah. that mentioned yeah. that it was yeah. like, a, like a prescription, you know, like really selling, which I'm not really sure what they do to talk about the plan of care. So do this. Do you, do you know what graduation rate is? Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. yep. um, so do you have therapists that have higher graduation rate than others? I don't know. I don't know if we can even track that, honestly. You, I don't know if you, our system does. You do it in an audit. You're not going to be able to pull it from your EMR. I've mm -hmm. heard claims that you can do it. I've never seen it done accurately, mm -hmm. but uh, you go through. So go back two months. So I would go back to April 1st, have any of you show your therapist how to do it. They go through, they list every single patient that they saw, and you don't need anything more than like the first initial of the first name, just so they're not confusing patients, how many visits they saw them for, and uh, the reason for discharge, right? So you're going to see people left town and never rescheduled. They dropped out for medical reasons, whatever it is. And then you just take the number of completed plans, divide it by the total number of patients. So if you saw eight was the example I gave before out of 20 in a given month, that would be a 40% graduation rate. It's a pretty big drop off, right? So that 60% of patients are dropping off. Almost every single time it goes back to how that therapist is talking to the patient on the very first visit about the plan of care. And you'll see people, clinicians with higher graduation rates typically are checking more boxes on day one about an in the beginning, it's usually about questions. The second one is how they talk about what, here's what successful treatment looks like. You're going to need, I'll just give an example. You're going to need twice a week for six weeks or three times a week for four weeks, whatever it is. And your therapists that do a better job of that, they'll have a higher graduation rate. So it would start with looking at what's going on. The other thing that it would be super helpful is any other topics. What topic would you want me to cover Next week, this one was around helping your therapist keep their schedules full. Going to what Joanne just said and, and part of how we send it, make sure that we increase our graduation date or rate. My friend does hates me when I do this. One, when I show up in the office, they hate when I do that. But if I answer the phone and someone's trying to cancel an appointment, I simply tell them we don't accept cancellations, but I'd be happy to reschedule that appointment to fill your prescription. And I just tell them, we don't, we don't do cancellations. We either reschedule or you show up for the appointment and they go, oh, okay. Yeah. Let me, let me pull my calendar. Yeah. Next Thursday works better. Okay, great. So we just don't take cancellations. We reschedule. Great point, Jess. Thanks for sharing. All right. Again, that event is July 18th. That'll be from 10, 10 a.m. to 3 Eastern standard time. It's the revenue per visit virtual summit. We'll be focusing on that. I've been working on, on a revenue per visit system to help owners improve that. We'll be talking about that at the virtual summit. You can go to getbreakthrough.com forward slash learn. And yeah, any ideas on topics before you sign off here, please post them in the chat. The thing that you're thinking about the most for your practice. Joanne, Brian, you got a good one? <laughs> I, don't, I feel like I'm juggling so many hats right now. I can't think of where I need to go. <laughs> okay, That'd probably be a good one. Right there, how to unload each individual spinning plate. Yeah. Right with yeah. scaling, with scaling employees. Yep. Okay. The the other one, the other one I think we're always working on, right? Like we talk about reimbursement rate is how to decrease the the tough rebound curve when you hire a new physical therapist. So when you hire the new PT and we're insurance based and we're we're hybrid, we're insurance based and a bit cash based, is like how how those first, you know, twelve weeks don't have to hurt so bad. And what are some ways that to reduce that? Yeah. We're getting better at it, but it's always Keep, helpful. Wait, what was the term rebound? Was yeah. That... Like that rebound effect. You know, you, you mean or recoil, I suppose you could use too. When you when you first start the, you know, you know what I mean, but when you hire a physical therapist, you're credentialing them and you're co-signing notes like crazy, but at the end of the day, those first two or three pay cycles come through. So how to scale that.
like I said, as we've gotten bigger, it's gotten easier. But I think when smaller practices, that's probably the one thing that we're always, it stops people from scaling as quickly. You lose money. Yeah, you lose money. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, great one. Awesome. Well, this call was recorded. Thank you all for being here and being highly engaged. I appreciate it. Have a great week. Thank cool. you. Thanks. My pleasure. See you. Private practice owners, are you tired of declining reimbursements and shrinking margins? Join me on July 18th for the Revenue Per Visit Virtual Summit. It's a value-packed, free, online live event where you'll discover strategies that you can put into action in your practice to boost your revenue per patient and enhance your practice's profitability. You'll hear from industry leaders and private practice owners like Mark Callanan from Anovis, who will be talking about how to increase revenue with cash-based services and Sterling Carter of Sterling PT and Wellness, who was able to increase his reimbursement rates by over 15% with providers. With more than eight speakers, five hours of actionable training, and hundreds of practices in attendance, you don't wanna miss out on this game-changing event. Click the link below to register today, and I'll see you there.